Hello everyone, today is a really exciting video for me to share. It's the first of my new series, Unique Wealth Builders, where I interview people that have chased wealth in a unique way. Today's guest, the first guest of this series, is Chris Furlong, and Chris is a great guy who's doing some great things. He is doing a bit of everything, to be honest. He's a YouTuber, he's a runner, but the thing that I'm mainly talking to him about today is reselling, flipping. So he buys things and he sells them on eBay. And it's a really great business idea. And me and Chris talk all about that, how he got into it, some tips for beginners. And then we talk about money in general, what his introduction to money was, what's his thoughts on crypto and NFTs. I really enjoyed recording this chat with Chris. I hope you get some value from it. And I'd really appreciate if you go and check out some of Chris's socials, his YouTube channel, all the links in the description. But I really hope most of all this conversation brings you value. And if there's any guests that you want me to get on or any types of industries you want me to cover, make sure you leave a comment down below. I hope you enjoy the video and let's get into it. All right, everyone. I would like to welcome my first guest of this series, the Unique Wealth Building series, which I've just covered there in that intro. And we've got Chris with us today. So how are you, Chris? Mate, I am I'm great. It's a beautiful day and um, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So you're in uh, the outskirts of Melbourne, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, about about 60k uh, southeast of Melbourne. So as we would say, out in the sticks. But I mean, it's <laughs> not really that far. I mean, I'm close close to the shops, but it is. It's a nice hidden little gem area. Well, I hope your weather's been better than we've had here in Adelaide. The last few days have been uh, cold, horrible. This is not what I want leading into summer. But I'm hoping that the hot weather's around the corner. Yeah, so. it has has been a bit of a roller coaster of crazy weather, but. We'll take what we can get. We'll always complain about the weather. <laughs> yes, that's true. So give me a quick, in a you know couple minutes, who are you? What do you do? And that's what we're going to start with. So <laughs> yeah, well, um, yep, Chris Furlong. Um, I mean, the way I would probably introduce myself to most people is, you know, I'm all about running, reselling, lifestyle and everything in between. But, um, you know, just to give some context for anyone that doesn't know. So at the start of this year, 2021, I, I took a leave of absence from working the nine to five. Um, by by trade, I'm a project manager in the IT industry. I uh, have been working for about seven years, and you know I, there was a whole bunch of dreams and goals that I wanted to pursue. And I figured, stuff it, if I don't take a chance now, I, I probably never won't will. So um, I took I've taken the year off, and I'm still obviously still in that year, and um, wanted to dedicate that time in, in building out a podcast called Further Your Lifestyle. Um, but of course, you know, not having any income, I need to be able to make some money at the same time. So turned to a, um, I guess, a natural hobby that I've kind of done over the years of reselling. And so buying, you know, whether it's online or buying from thrift shops and whatnot and, and selling online. Um, and at the other side of things, I like to do a lot of running um, just for yeah. fun, but also at the moment I'm training for my first ultra marathon, which <laughs> is is a bit overwhelming when you say it out loud like that. But um, I bet. yeah, but so at the <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm a marathoner, but yeah, training for my first ultra and um, a whole range of things. But I, I track all this on YouTube and share my journey. Um, but yeah, that that's probably me in a nutshell. And yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of you're probably one of the people I know that do <laughs> like a crazy amount of stuff, and people will quickly pick that up from like there's lots of things going on. But I think that's a really interesting point that's going to lead into a lot what this series is going to cover is taking that chance on yourself. And I love that thing that you bring into a lot of your videos is okay, well, I'm going to take this risk for a year. And to do that is a risky thing. And yeah. there's lots of different things people can put into that. So I know it's all about, okay, well, one, building up yourself into a financial position to be able to do that. Two, making sure you're not a big spender on unnecessary things. You know, when yeah. you start a business, you have to take that risk, but you can't do that if you've got $300,000 a year in expenses that you need to cover and this fancy, yeah. you know, $200,000 car loan and this massive, like you can't do that. So it's really interesting to hear someone that goes, I'm going to do that, understanding that, well, I need some kind of income, but then going the main focus is going to be pursuing passion projects that may become the income down the track. 100%. And that's what I really want to lead into. We're going to talk a lot about, you know, the YouTube thing obviously is a side thing for you, but the main focus I really want to talk about is the flipping thing. So for those that aren't aware, explain what a flipper actually does. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I mean, yeah, I guess it's one of the people can look at this from a controversial perspective, but basically buying low and, and selling high or, or selling for what it's worth. But I guess the best way to explain this is for, for Australians that are listening, we call them op shops, but globally, it's probably more known as thrifting or thrift shops. But essentially, yeah, going to those places or going to garage sales or 
whatnot. And buying something that I know is of greater value and then selling it online or Facebook marketplace or, or wherever. Um, but, you know, an example of this could be buying DVDs and flipping them from $1 and selling them for $20 or some books, you know, picking up 50 cents or a couple of dollars and, you know, some books might go for $20, $30. Um, yeah, wow. And then you've got things that, that range. Like I, I literally sell everything. I've got video games, clothing. I've sold brick brack in terms of like cutlery or, <laughs> um, you know, mugs, cups, egg cups, um, jewelry, like everything, anything. And it takes a bit of knowledge and education building to get to that position. But most of the time, you know, you've got stuff sitting around at home as well that yeah, I would definitely. be interested in. You know, whether it's, you know, just stuff that you've just got sitting on shelves and going to garage sales, picking those up and then basically just parting them out and, and selling them at the, the price that they're worth. Yeah, that's, it's, it's a crazy thing. And does it, does, like, I can see you've got the Pokemon stuff in the background yeah. and that, that brings me back to, you know, childhood things of, of trading cards. And I know that me personally, it was, I remember collecting trading cards and then going, well, this one's worth it. Like you open up a, a pack and go, yeah. well, I could probably sell this to friends and, Straight away, I remember thinking, oh, flipping things could be yeah. a thing. You, you know, you buy something for to $10 and maybe I could get 15 for it. And is that where your inspiration come from? Was it a childhood thing that you yeah. maybe sold something at the schoolyard that made you think <laughs> in a later track, well, I could do that on a little bit higher scale. I've got a bit more capital put behind me and actually buy some stock initially. And yeah. maybe this could become something that makes me some money. Yeah, look, I mean, when I, when I think about the roots, there's two stories that I go back to and one, I probably didn't realize what I was doing. And it, it's actually cheap as I must've been about seven or eight, but um, we lived on about two and a half acres. And I used to, um, I won't go into too much details because I don't know how legit it was back, back then. And I don't <laughs> want to incriminate anyone, but basically I used to um, sell frogs. Um, you know, people would buy frogs off me for their dams. Uh, we, I used to just harvest the frog eggs and grow the frogs yep. and then sell them or find the frogs and, and, and sell them. So yeah, back then it might've been $10 a frog or, or whatever, but, you know, as a seven-year-old, eight-year-old getting that kind of money and it was, it's good fun, but I guess I didn't really get it then. You know, I was just doing it because someone, oh, can you get a frog and I'll give you some money? It's like, oh, okay, cool. But, you know, probably when I first started to have intent with it was uh, probably when I was maybe 12, um, probably early, early high school. Um, I used to buy Yu-Gi-Oh cards off my friends. Yeah, um, me too. I didn't have an eBay account, my parents, but you know, like they would have a deck of 20 or whatever. And, you know, I'll be like, I'll give you 20 bucks for those 20 cards. And they're like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. And then I'll take four of those and sell them for 150 bucks. And I remember watching it. And back then you didn't have buy it now. It was all auction only. Yeah. yeah. And oh, the old, the old days of eBay bidding <laughs> for something. That's it. And I would, I remember listing it and, you know, you get no bids until like the last five minutes yeah. and watching Blue Eyes White Dragon sell for $150. This is the first editions. And this is yeah. back when they first came out. Um, and of course, now they're worth an absolute mint, but yeah. you know, watching them go for $150, my mom, my mom couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it, but that was really the first time I dabbled in that kind of thing, not knowing that I'd be doing it now. Um, but I guess, yeah, it's, it's always kind of been a part of me because I've always gone to garage sales with like my, my, my parents or my dad. He's kind of done more, I guess, automobile or cars and, and, and things as, you know, reselling those. So I've kind of probably been inspired yeah, by awesome. that from an early, early age. Yeah, the, the Yu-Gi-Oh story, it, it hits home for me. I, I remember as a child, I, I've got younger siblings and one of my brothers got a, I think it was a red eyes black dragon in oh, a yeah. booster pack. And it would have been an early edition. I remember having a, a Yu-Gi-Oh magazine where you could see the values of cards. Yep. And I can't remember what it was worth. It might've been 70 or $80 for this card. And, and it was like, oh, awesome. We, we could sell that. Finding the card that had been folded in half ah! had a massive crease line through the middle. And me going, I had no idea what even the word mint condition. I'm like, oh, is this mint condition? I'm like, this is definitely not. Oh. Couldn't sell it because it was just, it had been used by a yep. seven or eight year old playing oh. Yu-Gi-Oh. There was no... <laughs> But it was, my eyes were open. It was like trying to explain to mum, I think this card's worth money. And it was like, what do you mean it's worth money? And it's crazy to think about. So it's really interesting, those roots. Typically, a lot of people that do go into flipping have some kind of roots in it. And a few of my followers probably do follow Gary V, for instance. He does yeah. his Trash Talk series. And a lot Love of it. his comes back to the roots of selling lemonade on the side of the thing or flipping baseball cards. And I think a lot of us that are in this generation here, it's sports or Pokemon cards, yeah. Yu-Gi-Oh cards. It's your first experience of having something that you may acquire for a value. Yeah. And it's a bit of a luck kind of thing. And that might be worth more value in the future. And 
maybe today's generation of the younger people that are going through school and stuff, it's probably changed a bit, but it's going into, I suppose, online gaming, a lot of them. And yeah. so it's been a controversy where of say loot packs, for instance, but you're buying something and knowing that there could be something that's of yeah. more value in there. And we're going to talk about NFTs a bit later on, but it's going to be an interesting world that I think the flipping world is going to go digital where yeah. it isn't like that right now. And 100%. it's going to be a really interesting space because what you're doing is going to be able to done with physical goods and digital goods that yeah. maybe isn't quite there yet. So is there anyone that I know you touched on your parents there, but yeah. is there anyone else maybe later on in life that is doing the flipping that's really inspired you to go, hang on, these people are doing this maybe as a full-time living, for instance? Um, look, to be honest, no. So, I mean, look, I mean, I've always done it probably just because, I don't know, I've just always done it just because I enjoy going to op shops, but I used to just buy a lot of the stuff and never actually sell it. And then it was at the end of last year before I took a leave of absence. So I, I finished up in December and started from January, but basically from September to December, I was just doing, this is last year, 2020. I was just binge watching everyone else doing it online, whether it was local or international. And from that, I was able to gain a lot of information very, very quickly. And, you know, Gary V trash talk and all that. And yeah. um, I, I think, because I, I didn't need to be inspired or influenced. It was kind of more like, well, if I'm going to do this to pay some bills, I need to be able to get as much information and then just take that and run with it. So I use that and leverage that, but otherwise no, it's probably just always been there. Like, like I said, my dad always used to go to clearance sales or yeah. our garage sales and whether we were there to buy and flip, but I just learned that things are cheaper there and they have a higher value um, and that mentality always took, I mean, um, took to me. So then learning it and seeing how other people are doing it in this current day and age, I'm like, well, I can double down on this quite quickly because I already get it and I can go, you know, execute it very quickly from my, my background working as a project manager. I think that's a really good point is that and anyone that I have on this unique wealth building series of different approaches, whether it's business, whether it's investing, whether it's some type of hobby thing that you're yeah. doing, you've got to have the internal motivation to do it. You can't be just 100% inspired by someone else because then you'll just try and become a clone of them. Yep. And the chances are, if they're incredibly successful, it will be incredibly hard to clone what they're doing. Yeah. You know, we talked about Gary V there. I can't be Gary V. <laughs> I, I, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. I have to be internally motivated. Now you can have some motivation from different people of what they're doing. Oh, I, I want to take after that person. But if you don't have that internal motivation, you're going to run into challenges and not be able to overcome them. Correct. And that leads me into what are some of the challenges you have come across with flipping? Because I imagine it, it is a risky game when you're first getting started. I'm sure you'd have bought stuff thinking, oh yeah, I can yeah. flip that and then go, I can't even sell it for a dollar kind of thing. Have yeah. you had any real, like your main challenges going into it? I, I think, yeah, no, so that's a very good point. And because I had been doing it, you know, previously past, I, I knew things that works, but then, when, you know, cause you can't, you know, let's say I know a lot about star Wars. I'm not going to be able to just walk into a thrift shop and find star Wars 24 seven. So I need to be able to have that diversification. You know, maybe it's broader range of DVDs and books and stuff. So education, educating yourself is, is obviously key. And sometimes the best way to do that is if you can get a whole big box of things and pay 50 bucks, willing to take that risk, because let's say you get 50 items and you've paid 50 bucks. Okay. All I got to do is sell them for at least two bucks and I've doubled my money or I haven't lost my money, but also being willing to to learn okay if these don't work out then you know i got to take take the loss but i think in terms of biggest challenges or, or lessons it it has been look, there's stuff that i listed in january and i still haven't sold it but yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean it's it's not going to sell they just don't have a quick you know sell through rate i think the biggest challenge honestly for me has been going through lockdown um yeah. you know when i started at this we had come out of our first lockdown in Melbourne and I wasn't expecting that we were going to go through another big wave of it because, you know, I'd been sourcing for about three or four months, happy days, no issues. And um, we went into lockdown and all of a sudden I can't source. Well, not from yeah. my usual <laughs> methods. So it pushed me to, to change how I was playing, how I was operating. Um, so rather than going to thrift shops, I was, you know, working through networks of my own, whether it was um, trying to, buy out stock from places that were closing, deceased estates, um, people that were moving, uh, side of the road, um, and, and all those worked. And to be honest, a lot of the stuff that I got, I had a very low cost of 
37 cents or free or yeah, 67 crazy. cents because you know basically people need to get rid of stuff they couldn't take it to op shops so you know it's kind of like take it all or none so you take it all but you get it cheaper and some of it might not be worth that much but you know i had to literally go through the grind of listing dvds at nine dollars a pop and you know yeah. i mean i purchased them at 37 cents or whatever um and it was that grind so that's probably been the biggest challenge um and then obviously everyone else being in that same boat so trying to source that and, and compete it it has been quite a struggle but uh i got through it um yeah i'm not and gonna I guess say it's, funny. It easy. <laughs> it's about finding that gem in that that bundle and i know from yeah. running when i back ran an online retail store and that was a bit different because you obviously had you couldn't afford to be buying stuff because you didn't have the margin to you definitely weren't buying something for 37 cents yeah. for instance but it was crazy you don't know what will sell until you put it out there and I remember yeah. doing a Oz Comic Con back here in Adelaide five or six years ago when they actually still run them here in Adelaide. We kind of get left yeah. behind with most of these things nowadays. But having a, uh, it was an Iron Man and a Captain America salt and pepper shaker set. I yeah. think it was a Funko product. And on the morning of it, I, had, I only had one of it. And I had two or three yeah. people that one of the first things they looked at, thought, oh, that's cool. I'm interested. They didn't buy. I thought, geez, I wish I had more of these because these yeah. are going to sell like crazy. Two days later, I still had that one thing after... 20 or 30 people looking at thinking it was cool but not buying yeah and so it takes time to develop an yep. idea of what actually sells it might yep. not be those first things that you know on ebay okay someone's watched this item oh heaps of people are watching it that might not be what sells and i remember from my days on ebay it was like oh this is going to sell and then things that you didn't i remember having just a basic darth vader pop vinyl yep. and it would just sell routinely it would yep. just sell 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 you sell three or four of a week and yep. i suppose that's the thing it's about learning okay what's my you know, go home items that I know are just going to bring in that recurring revenue yeah. and what's the one off things. And that leads me to, is there a certain item or might be a couple of yeah. really cool that you go, Oh, that was an awesome sell. It might not necessarily be what you made the most money off, but a really awesome item you found along. If you had to narrow it down to a oh, couple. Jeebus. I mean, th this, I mean, there's so many different ways I could play this, whether it's just weird and wacky versus, you know, the big ticket items. But I think a couple that come fresh from the last week has, um, and it's kind of random, but just super cool to how it sells is, uh, you know, a Snoopy and Woodstock, you know, from the original yeah, comics, yeah, yeah. but it was a Woodstock. Um, I think it was a pepper actually. Yeah. It was a pepper shaker. <laughs> and the reason I only purchased it was when it was during lockdown, I needed a way to be able to source. So I was buying from uh, op shops that were selling online and stuff. And basically I, I think I bought an Xbox and a few other things and I was about five, $10 off from getting free shipping. Nah, otherwise, shipping free, was going to free shipping. Yeah, otherwise it was going to be like 30 bucks shipping. And I'm like, the cost of goods is going to be too much. So I just went quickly through and found, Oh yeah. A pepper shaker, Woodstock looks collectible, whatever. Um, it was five bucks or 10 bucks or whatever. And I'm like, stuff it. I'll chuck it in. And I get free yeah. shipping. So it brought down like cost of goods. Anyway, I got that listed it, did a bit of research and, you know, the, the complete set goes for about 50 bucks because it's from like 1980s and it's from Japan. But of course I didn't have the complete set. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I listed that back in July and I sold it last week. Um, a lady from the UK reached out and she's like, oh, I really want this. How much would it be to ship to UK? Turned out it was going to be way too much. Like I had it listed at $19. Um, and she said, Oh, look, I have a, a girlfriend or a friend that lives in Sydney. Can you ship to them? I said, sure, of course. Yeah. Um, so they paid a total of $27 for this, this item with a, which I've paid between five and 10 bucks. I can't remember what it evened out to, and it's gone to Sydney. And then when they go to UK, whenever that will, they'll take yeah, it, with yeah. it. But you know, it, it just goes to show people will pay, yeah. for, <laughs> pay for these weird and wonderful items. And then the Is other one, one person in the, in the globe, that, we're not just right. talking it doesn't have to be like, oh, in your hometown. It's the globe. 100%. And it's that one person that goes, that's the one I need. I can't find it anywhere else. I want to, I'll get it by any means necessary. And the other, the, the other crazy one, which was back, back probably in March, I think it was, I was up in Ballarat and I picked up a clamshell VHS. Clamshells is the really big ones. And it was the Goonies. Um, so one of the original versions of it and yeah. um, couldn't test it, whatever, because I didn't have the VHS player and, purchased it for 50 cents and went onto eBay and had a look and see what other people were selling. And people were selling this at $120. I was like, what the heck? Why? And it was because it was the clamshell original version. And I was like, okay, what not? And I'm like, stuff it. I'll, I'll put it on 110 and I'll put in this, you know, in the statement saying that, you know, have not tested, yeah. you know, buying as is. And I kid you not put it up, sold in 10 minutes, boom, full price. I was like, what the heck? And 
the lady who purchased it, she sent me a little message and lovely old lady. And she said, oh, yeah. thank you so much for the opportunity to purchase this. Can you let me know when you're going to send it? And she was telling me that, you know, she used to watch this with one of her girlfriends when she was younger and it's her favorite show. And she's so excited to be able to, you know, get it again. And I, I'm like, oh crap, I hope she read the, the thing. And I, <laughs> I sent back and said, you know, happy to do business. And I'm like, just want to make sure you know that I haven't tested it. It might not work. And you know, there's no refunds. And she's like, that's fine. I just want to put it on the shelf. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> um, so, I mean, there's, there's heaps that's, of those stories. Yeah, that's really cool. And it, I think that's crazy. one of the cool things about it is the you're selling something and obviously you're doing it and you're hoping you make some money off it, but you probably miss, you wouldn't even know some of those crazy stories on the other side when people receive some of those packages of the nostalgia. I, I went to a toy and comic fair three or four months ago and it was just cool seeing some of the old things that I'm like got out of chip packets and all yep. those crazy things, which I'm sure you dump into all the time that you yep. come across at places. And yep, all the some time. of them don't even hold value, but it's probably cool just going to the op shops and saying, Oh, that's cool. I remember that. And some of those cool memories and stuff. And yeah, if you were, you know, we could talk about flipping all day. I love the topic <laughs> and I'm, I know you do too. I know you talk about it all the time on your channel, but if there was like one bit of advice and I know this is a cliche thing, but if there's yes. one bit of advice for someone that was, you know, maybe considering it, what would that be? Getting into flipping, that is. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, s start with what you know, like start from home, yeah, have a definitely. thrift at home. Um, you know, we have, I mean, you can see in the back, I've got so much stuff and a lot of us yeah. do. Um, and, you know, a lot of it's my collectible stuff, but you've got stuff in the cupboards or DVDs, video games, go through and start with, so there's zero cost, right? Yeah. And see what interests you um, and try selling that. Otherwise, what do you know that you would buy or what the value is? So if you're into Pokemon, you know the value of it. You know what you would pay. So if you know you can get one for 20 bucks and you can sell it for 50 bucks, that's what to work with. Work with what you know. Um, and then as you start to get a bit more confident, you can start to branch out to books, DVDs, whatever, yeah, and definitely. find find your niche. But no, yeah, I love that. I, yeah, that's I think starting with advice. what you know and starting around the house because like you said, there's zero cost. You can learn how eBay works. You can learn how shipping works. It's a real challenge. Go, I think you've done a few videos on your yeah. channel about how to ship certain things. But yeah, go through what you've got, sell the things that you don't want and learn about yeah. what actually sells, what you can get for things. And then you start to straight away, it's just education. It's And you know we're lucky enough today, we have phones in our pockets. You can search things up That's at it. an op shop and go, oh, does this thing, I know you can even, I'm pretty sure you can scan barcodes and crazy yes. things like that yeah. too. You know, it's not like back in the days where you would have had to know this stuff before you went there. You can educate yourself to stuff on the go trial and error you're going to have things that don't work you're going to have things that work much better than you were yeah. you're going to have days where you sell nothing days where you sell heaps all the time i think it's a crazy yeah and it just just what i want to introduce people to is that there's lots of different ways that you can build wealth it's not all about doing a nine to five or starting a traditional style business i've actually got i think five or six maybe it might even getting closer to 10 clients that do flipping and yeah. over half of them do it full time now so yeah. it's really cool i love working with people like that because it's like oh, this is a cool business idea. And when they've spoke to their previous accountants, they're like, yeah, they've literally told them outright, oh, that's a stupid idea. And I'm like, oh my God, like, <laughs> I can't get my head around it. And it's like, I love working with people that are doing things that are unique. Because one, I can't run every business. I've spoke about it before. I wish I could run every type of business. I'd, I'd love to get into flipping. And, you know, it's, it's on my list of things like, oh, maybe I could give it some time. And then I'm like, where am I going to pull that time from? But <laughs> by getting to work with people that do these things, it's, it's really cool. So yeah. Like I said, we could talk about this all day, but let's jump into the next thing that I really want to talk about. And I've talked about it on a live the other night is money motivations. Yeah. And for those that didn't catch that, and I, I've explained it to Chris in the past, is that I think people are motivated by different things when it comes to money. You can't ignore money. It, it revolves, like you said, you've you've left a position where you're obviously getting paid and go, yeah. I want to take, take a chance and do things I love, but you have to generate an income to pay bills. Correct. And it, it's too simple to go, I don't care about money. Oh, no, nah, money doesn't doesn't motivate me but at a general level it does to everyone in different ways and i managed to break that down i i'm sure it's probably somewhere else but my ideas of you know breaking down what motivates people when it comes to money i kind of broke it down into three areas and went okay some people are motivated by the money itself the lifestyle and the riches of it and yeah that gets a it gets a bad you know bad name for itself because people go oh you just want money you want to get those fancy watches those fancy yeah. cars but again that's okay some people are motivated by the freedom behind it yeah. So like, that's probably a bit of what yours is going to be, which I'll, I'll talk to you about in a second. But you know, that freedom to be able to take a risk on things or to spend yeah. more time with family to travel. And then others, which is probably me, is a lot of mine is about achievement. So yeah. it's going, 
okay, money is just linked to, I want to build a successful business. Obviously businesses involve money and therefore by me succeeding in business is going to be something to do with money. Yep. So it's a bit of a, you know, high level topic, higher thinking, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, what motivates you? Is it that freedom style thing? Is it, is it the lifestyle and, you know, yep. the riches? Is it, you know, being able to go and buy yep. those Pokemon cards that are behind you, for instance, or is it, um, yeah, like, is it one, which, how does that work for you? I'd love, yeah. love to hear a bit about that for yourself. Look, um, it's probably changed over the years and, and maybe it hasn't, but, you know, I, I think for me, if I broke it down into percentages, you know, it's probably, uh, I would, I would almost nearly say it would be a three-way 30 split, but yeah. it's probably actually closer to a 40% achievement, 40% freedom and 20% lifestyle slash riches. But um, because I guess freedom and lifestyle kind of play hand in hand almost, yeah, but yeah. I mean, achievement wise, you know, it, it's different. So like me working for myself, there's a huge drive for achievement because yeah. you know what I put in is what I get out. Whereas when you're working for someone else, you know, I could do 90% today or put in 110% the next day and I'm still going to get paid for the same, right? Yeah. You know, it, so it, it's a little different, but so I think working for myself, yeah, definitely it's driven by the, the achievement and the freedom of it because I'm definitely not earning the same amount of money that I was. Like I'm probably earning at the moment about, I would kid you not about 20% of what I was earning previously working. And now obviously I'm only 11 months in, but. But are you, do you love doing what you well, do? Exactly. Oh, and and, and I, I have the freedom of time. I'm achieved so much from zero, starting from zero. And I also have the lifestyle of being able to do what I want when I want to. Now, obviously, aside from buying whatever <laughs> I want, um, yeah. but you know, the time I have the freedom of time, you know, I can jump on a call with you, you know, anytime yeah. and, and have this conversation, I can build my YouTube, I can do my podcast, I can resell, I don't have to be working for anyone's time, but my own. Uh, so it, it really has, yeah, really is probably around that achievement and freedom. And then obviously down the track, I'm a long term player that that it will eventually bring me that lifestyle and I guess a bit more freedom around, you know, some some playing money as well. Yeah, which is I think that's awesome. And the achievement side of thing, I, I knew you'd be heavy into that. I've seen your spreadsheets and I know <laughs> that it's not about for me, I love having a spreadsheet where I tick a goal off kind yeah. of thing or or that style of thing. So it's not necessarily about it might be a money goal, but it's not going, I need that money because I yeah. need a hundred thousand dollars because I want to go buy that fancy car Correct. tomorrow. And that's and there's nothing wrong with having that. Like there's things I would love to do. I, I really want a Tesla one day. It's something I yeah, really same. want to get. But it's not that motivation. That's just a part of it. And I think there's nothing yeah. wrong with, I think it gets such a bad stigma when people go, I want to have designer clothes or I want to do that. If that's what motivates someone, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Obviously a lot of my channel is focused on money and we're talking about ways to save money. And obviously some of those strategies may not be smart early on, but you yeah. may be able to put strategies in that it might be at 30 years old, you can go reward yourself or you might do once a year, do things. So it's, it doesn't have to be one thing or the other. And like yeah. I said, that's why, and I'm probably going to do more in-depth videos on this about myself. So people will know, but it's really interesting to talk to people that I, I spoke to my partner about it last night and she has a different split to what I do. And yeah. we worked well together, but we have different splits. She's a lot yeah. about that freedom kind of things that, you know, family orientated and wants to eventually have kids and things like that. So wants to put herself in the financial position where that she can have that time yeah. and doesn't really care about the riches or maybe the achievement as much as what I yeah. do, but everyone is different. And that's why I want to talk to people that are doing different things. You know, business owners are probably going to have a different breakup to someone yeah. that works, works a job. And like you said, that achievement when you're working a job isn't as because it's not linked to you. You can work really yeah. hard, but unless you're involved at an equity level and getting a shareholdings return from that, correct? <clears throat> the business can make a million dollars and you might not get a cut. You might get a small yeah. bonus or something, but it's not directly linked. So yeah, it's an interesting topic. And you know, we could it's a really deep thinking topic, but I just wanted to touch on that on briefly. So what I want to jump into is, is we're going to jump into four or five different topics here. They're going to be quick. We don't have to need to go into too yeah. in depth, but I just want to get, these are more things that I do cover on my channel all the time. So I want to get your quick thoughts on, you know, what your education is on and what is it something you think about? Because not everyone's going to be as interested in all these topics. And it's yep. going to show that, you know, you as a business owner, well, maybe this is what you value and this is what you don't. So the first one is tax. Is yep. it something that you like even care about? Is it something you like to educate yourself on or yep. do you just rely on, you know, ship it off to your account and go, you deal with that? Um, it's a bit of both. I think, you know, previously working for nine to five, I didn't have to have too much focus on it. Um, just making sure that I'm offsetting any expenses or depending on what tax bracket as I've grown yeah. over the years. Um, and, but then, you know, as obviously as you grow, you get investments or buy property and whatnot, and then it starts to get a bit more complicated, but 
I've, I've, to be honest, I've never done my own tax. So ever yeah. since I, like, I didn't start paying tax until my first job, which well, my, my first full-time job, which was until must've been 22. Um, and that was the gig that I've come from. So day one. And at that time I already had some little investments, I think. So yeah. I'm just like, stop it. I'll just pay the accountant. I get to claim that on tax the next yeah. round and yeah. one less thing to worry about. But now that I'm doing my own business, you know, I'm, mindfully thinking about it all the time um you know putting money aside for tax day and things like that so i'm not getting caught out in the in the long run um and you know so you learn over time but it's definitely something which until you go through the experience you realize oh i could have done better and then you you, yeah. you put the next improvement in for the next year yeah and i know that i know we've had conversations we had a conversation the other day about stock and yeah. it's it's i think as a business owner and this is going to differ depending on you know who the guest is you as a business owner I think it's it's incredibly naive to go, well, I'm going to ignore that and rely on the accountant yeah. to do it all. You have to, obviously, you want to be able to have someone that you can rely on to educate you on that, make sure it's done right. But you want to have some kind of education yourself. So I think that's really interesting. And what about money education in general? Is it, obviously, everyone has a different journey with, with money. Was it something you were interested in as a child or as a teenager, yeah. like learning about just in general, okay, I need to save money or I need to budget. And where did that education come from? Because I know a lot of people's first experience may be from their parents or through yeah. the schooling system, whether that's a good thing or not. But <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, yeah, I, I don't agree with the schooling education around money, but um, look, it probably has come from my parents. It's not like they drilled it into me, but it's probably more just seeing how they operated with money. Yeah. Um, which has influenced me, but I, otherwise I've been self-taught, like self-interest. I've awesome. always been, uh, I guess I've always been a hoarder of money. Like, you know, yeah. I don't like to spend necessarily in, until now, now that I earn more, but you know, I used to save a lot and I used to then value it in terms of, okay, I want to now go buy this. Um, so I've always been a big saver and that's learned me to, that that's probably put how I've, I guess, you know, my mindset around money, but then as I started to get a bit more interested in it and learning and, you know, when you get 16, 18, get your first job and start paying for things yourself, you know, I went through the process of learning about the envelope system. That's when I was getting paid in cash. Yeah. And then went through the barefoot investor, um, rich dad, yeah, I, poor I dad. Book sitting over there, yeah, I mean, rich dad, poor dad. I have on my phone an audio book. Yeah. Great book. And, and then, you know, then just learning, listening and, and, and learning along the way. But that, that's really it. Um, I, I've always been like, I'm, I'm a self-motivated individual. Like I've always been a very studious person. So that that's what motivates me because I've done it myself. I've done it. You know, no one's handed me anything. And, you know, all of a sudden I've just got money. I've built it myself. Yeah. Maybe I've, you know, whether it's got a, had a scholarship or I might've got money from, you know, grandparents or something like that, but it's given to me and I handed it in a way which makes more sense. And uh, like, that's, that's awesome. Uh, I think yeah, it's, it's yeah. really good that to be self-educated I would say 99% of people's first experience with money is how their parents handle it. And unfortunately, that's not always a good experience. Yeah, There's plenty of people I see and they're molded by the way their parents handle money. And I think myself, my first education was, well, my dad handled a lot of that kind of things. Mum was involved at some level, but you know, I remember dad having a book of splitting up his, his money, which is a bit yep. like that envelope system. And, yep. and I still do a very similar method via spreadsheet today. Yep. So that first education, but I think it becomes a really important step probably when you first get your first job. Yeah. You know, from that teenage years, when you're old enough, you can educate yourself. Forget what you're taught by your parents. Forget what you're taught by school. Educate yourself on a way that's going to work for you. And the earlier you do it, I wish I'd done it even earlier again. The earlier you educate yourself on things, the better. So that leads directly into investing. Yeah. You know, you don't need, I don't want specifics. I don't need to know, oh, well, you know, I invested in Afterpay or something like that. And yeah. I'm not interested in that. I'm just more interested was investing something that interests you? Is it something that still does invest? In, sorry, yeah. interest you at all? Yeah, I look, I mean, um, so it's always hindsight, one of those things you wish you always started earlier, but I, um, I probably started investing, must have been about 22. Um, that was in the share market. And that was probably, you know, maybe a thousand bucks. And then I kind of left it. And then I came back two years later and really started to, you know, go into it. And now I put in every, every month a certain amount, usually around a thousand dollars. Um, but I also got into property as soon as I could afford it. Um, that was probably when I was 24. Um, I always had a goal to, I wanted to own my house by 25, but I realized that that's not going to happen. So <laughs> having my house, having a house, actually, I've got two rental properties. Um, and that's with my brother as well. So we, we, we worked on that one together. And so I, I've had it from an early day. And I think it's now I've realized the power of that, but it's like, 
I'm now trying to tell people that are, you know, 18 or 20 yeah. that if I had started when they, you know, when I was their age and I would have had four or five years up on what I've already have now. So I've been in the, in the market for about seven years in terms of shares. And like, I've got, like, I've got a really good share portfolio, but no, that's awesome. I'm thinking, imagine if four years were on top of that, yeah. um, you know, and, and it's not about greed or anything, but you, you learn, once you've learned that and gone through that experience, you realize, huh? Yeah. It makes so much yeah. more sense now. Yeah. Um, I did the yeah. video on my channel the other day. Of, I only started investing at 23. Oh, uh, that's right. Yeah. And so, yeah, similar to you there. And, Again, I only put, I think I put two grand in at the start. I think it was four lots of $500. Yep. And again, it was all a learning experience. And then you don't touch it much to start with. You're a bit like, oh, I don't know what to do, et cetera. And I'm like, oh, if I'd only done this at 18 when I first <laughs> knew about shares, like I remember learning about yeah. school. It's like, I wish I'd just started and yep. started to educate myself. And it's going to lead, and my, my channel talks a lot about crypto and it's an interesting, it's a touchy subject for some, yep. but it was something that I learned about years before I first invested it. I remember talking yeah. to people going, oh, Bitcoin, like joking about, well, how does mining work? And, yeah. you know, being like, oh, it's, it's just crazy. But is crypto something that interests you? And it's going to be interesting because I'm going to ask these people and not everyone's going to be interested. And that's that's okay. Like, true. I don't want people to just go, oh, shift all their money into crypto. Definitely don't do that. Yeah. But yeah, is it something that does interest you? Yeah, so with crypto, great, great topic. Um, yes, um, like, so I invested only the start of this year. I, I Anytime, my advice, just to be clear for anything that you invest in is be willing to lose it, right? Yeah. Um, and so I basically put $500 into Bitcoin and I think it was $1,000 into Ethereum or might've been the yeah. other way around. And that was at the start of the year. So now it's, it's worth about $6,000. So what I intend to do with that, I don't know, but I knew I wanted, I'm, I love it. I know the potential of it and I'm learning it and I'm excited about it. So I figured, well, I'm a long-term player. Like, you know, I'll set and forget if I have to, but if I didn't put anything in, I would regret it. And knowing that because of doing the share market, I realized how, how you know, I guess the potential it can bring. So super excited about what that space is doing. It's also very scary and can be a bit overwhelming, but yeah, no, definitely super keen to, to see what else comes of it. And I need to spend a bit more time before I just start chucking more money in, but definitely keeping it topped up. I think I got some doggy coin as well, but that was like, I think I put 50 bucks in or something. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's quite a, a good model for a lot of investing is that, you know, put down a little bit of money, what you can afford to lose. Yeah. You touch the big players quite often. They're normally a bit safer, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum. And it allows you to start learning. The easiest yeah. way to learn about any topic is to be involved in it and investing such a true thing. This crypto is just learning, okay, well, how, how do I create an exchange account, for instance? That's well, it. it's, I have a video coming out. Uh, it should be tomorrow, actually. This is being recorded on Tuesday, but it'll be coming out tomorrow on crypto wallets and just talking about the different types of wallets and yeah. how they actually work. And it's one of the craziest concepts that... You know, I have clients that come to me because their other accountant is just like bamboozled by the term yep. wallet in general. So <laughs> it's an interesting thing. And I think learning about new things never hurts. It doesn't mean you have to go all yep. in on something or even be involved. You might learn about a subject and go, no, nah, I don't think that's going to work. I'm not yep. touching it. And a lot of things fail. And so it's, it doesn't ever harm you to be educated on something. Yep. So 100%. the next one is NFTs. Do you, do you even know what they are? It's It's... If people think crypto is here on craziness, yeah. NFTs are right up here. Yeah. And a lot of the crypto community hate on NFTs. So it's really interesting. I don't want to, you know, in-depth thing, but are you aware of NFTs? What's, what's your thoughts on them? Yeah, yeah, so totally aware and love the potential and super excited. Um, I was actually chatting to a friend about this today. And, you know, basically I would like to purchase one. I want to get into that space. But the way I look at it, it's the same way I've approached my Pokemon card collecting is, you know, there's so much hype about it at the moment and yeah. a lot of people just buying and buying and, you know, not really buying for any other reason, but fear of missing out. And yeah. when I got into the Pokemon space, you know, I was just doing it because everyone was doing it. But then I realized, well, what do I actually want from this? And, you know, I built up a bit of a chase list of cards that I wanted. And now I spend money just to achieve that, that, that chase list. And it's the same with NFTs is what my approach will be is until I find something which is of value to me in terms yeah, of, that's it. okay, if I buy this and I lose, you know, it doesn't go up to a hundred thousand dollars or it's not going to be a big ticket item. Am I still going to be happy with it? And I think that's, that's what I'm looking for. And I haven't found it yet. I'm probably more looking from a utility perspective, not necessarily looking for something to flex because, yeah. you know, that's not what I'm at. And plus no. I don't have that kind of money to be able to flex. Uh, so oh, you, you yeah. don't have a hundred ETH just sitting a while. Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. So I'm looking more for something that's going to bring practicability or, you know, maybe, you know, 
I'm not saying it will be a band, but the bands are starting to bring out more and yeah. they seem to have a lot of utilities behind it. Or, you know, Gary V's yeah. was a good one. That would have been something I would have jumped into, but at the time I didn't have um, yeah. what I had now and things like that. And I wasn't educated. So now I'm just looking and playing. I do like the idea around like VV collectibles and stuff, but once again, I don't want to just buy it for the sake of it because yeah. there's things in there, which eh, not really my cup mm -hmm. of tea yet. So definitely getting ready and trying to educate. So when I am ready to pounce, I can and execute quickly. No, that's, that's awesome. And I, you know, I keep looking at those Pokemon cards that are sitting <laughs> behind you, but anyone that's into those kind of things, go and educate yourself on it because it's just moving some of these things digital. And I was involved in NBA top shot. A I actually got out of it and probably considering selling what I've got. I don't have a lot. I, I made a grand off it or something like that. Yeah. And I only put, you know, a couple hundred dollars in, but it's the what I loved about it is you opened a pack and yeah. you could sell every single thing in there if you it's, didn't want it. So, so if you open a card of Pokemon <laughs> cards and it's like you get those, I'm sure I don't know what you do with all your extra Pokemon cards, yeah. but a lot of them have no value at all. Yeah, I've and got about like, probably about 1200 cards, yeah, that have no value. Yeah, yeah. and that was what I was like about the NFTs. It's like even the ones that had no massive value, I could still sell them for a dollar. Yeah, and you know, if I paid ten dollars for a pack, but I could sell five of them for a dollar, for instance. Well, I've recouped some of that. I can just move on. And someone else yeah. goes, oh, I want that. It doesn't have any value, but I want it. And that's what I liked about, there's no postage, there's nothing like that. And that's what's interesting. So an interesting question for you. If someone made an NFT of you, what's the one physical characteristic of it you'd want to yeah, look, represent you? I think it would have to be a beanie and a big smile. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I was thinking about this a bit more because you know, physical, it doesn't really play well well, it, it plays well because everything has a physical appearance. But then if I was thinking if I could put some utility characteristic to it, um, I, I think it would be, I would want, if I had yeah an NFT after me, the utility on it would have to be rewarding those most loyal. So someone that was yeah. to hold onto it the longest, because it, it's a funny thing. I feel like everyone's trying to flip and make money, but yeah. I feel like what if you, the longer you hold on it, the, the more value it is. Um, yeah, and that. I'm a very loyal person and I'm looking for that loyal fan base. Um, and that would be the way I would look at it. No, I love that. And definitely as soon as I put this question down to ask you, I was like, he's going to say the beanie. It's going to be the beanie. <laughs> I love it. So no, I think it's a really interesting space and not everyone's going to like it. And there's going to be so many projects that fail. And I keep telling people, do your own research into these things and, and make sure if you're looking for something for a quick buck, the chances are by the time you're hearing of it, yeah. it's, it's already gone past that. That's right. You want to buy something you want to hold. And especially when we talk about collectibles, it's very different to investing in shares or crypto, for instance, where most of the people that are investing in those things are obviously, you know, you're not investing in Telstra shares for, for the thrill of holding Telstra shares. You are hoping they go up in value, for instance. When you invest yeah. in a collectible style thing, if it hasn't got utility or something, you're investing because you like the artist or if you're collecting yeah. Pokemon cards, you're 100%. investing because you want those Pokemon, et cetera. So that, and that takes away the risk of, well, if it doesn't go up in value, you don't care because you're not planning on selling it quickly. Correct. So I could keep you here all day, but tell the people, I want you to tell them where should they go to find out more about what you're doing? Because it sounds like you're doing a lot of things. So <laughs> give us, you know, Give us the plug. Well, where should people go to find yes. out more about you? Look, um, most places you'll find me is under C. L. Furlong. Um, if anyone's interested in finding like my landing page or you'll find a newsletter or the best access to everything is clfurlong.com. Um, otherwise, if you go to my go to YouTube, C. L. Furlong. If you go to Instagram, underscore C. L. Furlong, underscore. Um, and for the podcast, which is furtheryourlifestyle.com. Uh, so just type in furtheryourlifestyle, you'll find that. And yeah, anything, if, pretty much if you Google CL Furlong, you'll find some <laughs> access to me in some, you know, some way or form. And um, that that would be the best place. And YouTube, I, I'm doing about uh, three to two, two to three videos a week, reselling, running um, Pokemon cards and a few things in between. And obviously the podcast that comes out on a weekly basis as well, which is similar to this kind of style interviewing and, and having guests on there and talking about, you know, how to build a lifestyle, chase passions and hobbies. And then, you know, I've got, a few other things in that Instagram that's probably more behind the scenes and just yeah. things that I like to do in life. So yeah, there's a lot there. Yeah. I, I might be biased, <laughs> but everyone should go and head over and check out Chris's podcast. I was a guest on an earlier episode, but there's some real great guests that you've had on there. And I found some of their stories really interesting and, you know, people that I've actually then had conversations with and it's been really great. So definitely go and check out Chris's YouTube channel as well. You've got what I love about how you approach YouTube with the flipping stuff is you're so transparent with things. And I mean, I'm a spreadsheet nerd. I love the complex spreadsheets you've got, 
But I love that you're just honestly being like, okay, these are my goals and I'm not going to hit them all. I'm going to hit some, some are going to fail, yeah. but I'm just going to keep showing up. You keep saying that all the time, just keep being there. So I really appreciate you coming on here. I'd love for some of the people watching to go check Chris's stuff out. He's such an awesome guy. He's doing so many awesome things. It might be a bit hard when you first jump out there to work out, you know, what you want, but just go and check out some of those things, whether it's running, whether it's Pokemon, whether it's flipping, go and check those out because Chris has some great content. I really appreciate you being here. Really appreciate you giving out your time. So thanks, Chris. And I'm sure we'll talk heaps soon in the future. Oh, well, thank you, mate. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure to be here. And yeah, I'm overwhelmed with thank you. So <laughs> thanks so much, mate. <laughs> no worries. Thanks, mate.